And thank you, Kyle. Thank you, everyone who's presented so far. That was, um, uh, my mind is really blown tonight. I'm really, uh, I have seen these before, Anita, but um, but I think they're starting to put more of the pieces together here than, than even last time I saw it. So it's sort of, uh, um, easier to kind of digest, but I also um, I also think that some of the models that were just presented are uh, something we definitely need to follow up with here. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about housing in my proposal, um, although it's one sort of small piece of that and one narrow um, uh, uh, parcel. Um, let me go to my screen share. And, but I also wanted to do say, let's see if I can do full screen here. Sorry, give me a second. Um, maybe present. Let me know if you all can see that. Good. Okay. Um, and I'm going to add uh, before I start that I, you know, I was going to go through all my slides here and have a little bit of history of my organization and how um, the development proposal that I'll talk about tonight kind of came to be. But I just wanted to to kind of pause for a second and say that um, some of the participants here we have a really cool cross-section of, of uh, students and educators and folks with all different backgrounds here on this call. And the idea that, I, you know, I see a lot of our uh, social work um, students here from the School of Social Work, and, and I see landscape architects uh, and others. And I think that the, the last presentation in particular was a really cool, like, cross-section of how the social and social justice and economic issues of what we what we experience in America and certainly in Newark um, cross up with sort of the design uh, and the sustainability elements that we've been talking about. So I just really wanted to thank and commend um, all the students uh, so far because you know this really affirms my belief that you know young people can can solve all of our problems. So <laughs> uh, and really and really carry carry us forward. So. Um, there's some really cool things that have, that have definitely got me thinking tonight. Um, so thank you for everything so far. And let me see, how do I, okay, here we go. So welcome, uh, for those of you who haven't been to Swag Project Farm. Uh, we're located at uh, two different parcels in South Newark. Uh, the one you see on the left is sort of a very stark, like dark picture of uh, uh, Peshine Avenue uh, side, which I'm going to talk about. It's 438 and 440 Peshine. It's a double lot. And on the right, you see a lot of the team uh, that was involved in found, uh, kind of founding the project and building the programmatic side. And that actually is real food that we've grown. Um, and that was all from, from one year. I think that was 2014. That was our uh, small first pop-up farmer's market stand on 343 Meeker Avenue. Um, a little bit of history. So a lot of people know me from Urban Agriculture Cooperative. That's the organization that I'm heading up and co-founded now. But for basically 12 years, so 10 years before that, uh, most of my work here in Newark was with Planting Seeds of Hope. And it's an organization that is very small nonprofit I'm still involved with um, and really um, was not an overall food systems organization or supply chain sort of organization but was, um, was really a community development um, uh, enterprise. And so we came to community gardening uh, and urban farming as a way to um, uh, develop communities, to have uh, collaborative spaces for different students from the community to work in together, um, and really just to kind of create cohesion in the neighborhoods that we were working in. Um, and so tonight I'm going to tell like a little bit of the story of this 438, 440 Peshine Avenue. It is currently st uh, still a city owned lot um, after all these years of us renting it. Um, it and we've activated it as a garden. Uh, it's a very sort of um, medium density, typical Newark residential neighborhood. It is not like downtown Newark uh, with high rise buildings. It is more of a two and three family uh, st uh, style uh, neighborhood. And we are a member of um, the Newark Community Food System, and in particular, the Land Tenure Working Group, which uh, Tobias and I have been very involved with over the last um, year in particular, around uh, these specific issues of how do we create long-term sustainable uh, land ownership. Um, so many of our community gardens have been threatened or lost over the years that I think it's prompted a lot of people to come together and say, what are our strategies? Like, how can we, preserve some of this great work that's going on without losing the land. 
All right, so this was the starting point. So this is the church I spoke about. This is uh, the first tabernacle. It's actually a, a Black Hebrew organization at this, this time, but it has a long history of being a Catholic and other churches. We literally started like that with about 10 uh, boxes there, six long ones and four square ones. Um, and um, this was a, a community development project. This was a, a labor of love. This was a, a hobby project in many ways for planting seeds of hope where we didn't really know much about the food system or about all the food needs in the community, but we did know that the church uh, that we were partnered with and the local schools wanted to um, have, a, have a garden and have an educational and community space. And so we helped them build it. Um, so over the years, uh, you know, what, what started is I think like, a, you know, like I said, a community service or um, a, a social justice kind of organization. And we, we began learning new things and we began understanding a lot of neighborhood needs, um, spending a ton of time in the South Ward and engaging with schools, parents, teachers, uh, neighbors. Um, and so while I wasn't you know, particularly well versed in food systems when I came out of grad school as a as an urban planner. I was uh, very interested and had learned a lot about racial and economic segregation, unfortunate history of a lot of American cities um, in, in terms of those those patterns and access, uh, accessibility of food and housing and all those types of issues. So that kind of gave me a grounding for what we um, what we were learning in the neighborhood as we continue to grow this farm. Um, so we did, we did very quickly get to a point where we realized that we can produce a lot of food here, even as sort of amateurs. Um, and we had more and more volunteers and interns getting interested as well as uh, members of the church and school. Um, so in 2013, we journeyed around the corner to Peshine Avenue and adopted a city lot. And this basically doubled our size. Um, and like I said before, a lot of people know me as Urban Ag Co-op, so I'm just kind of giving the brief history here. But these are kind of all the skills and experiences and things that we learned in, in eight or nine years uh, by doing this kind of grassroots neighborhood development, including meeting great partners like Tobias and other folks around the city who were doing similar things, but from a different perspective. And we started to form a network um, and we started to get a lot of you know, project management experience under our belt. We started to learn a lot about the food supply chain and, and how to move local food and meet more farmers um, and uh, composting projects. All the things that we do now under Urban Ag Co-op were really during this formative period is really where I, where I learned most of these things. All right, so returning to that Peshine Ave lot. So, you know, even, even today, what's the, what's the future of this lot? You know, that's kind of the main question of, of uh, what we're facing as an urban uh, ag community right now is what's the future of all of our lots? The, the first lot you guys saw was uh, a private lot, but even that one, you know, the church is eventually um, going to sell that land. Uh, they're an older congregation. They can't keep up the property. So, so that permanency of that farm is not, you know, is not even uh, necessarily guaranteed. And certainly we've learned the hard way that city lots are not a guaranteed space for us. So, um, and then as you can kind of see from this picture, it's not, not one of our greatest pictures, but what you can see in the background is uh, some infrastructure going up. So over the last 10 years, we've started to embrace opportunities. You know, when, when you're a small nonprofit and you get grants or you get donations, of something, sometimes you can't wait for other issues like your permanent land tenure to be sorted out. And you just have to accept those things. So we needed a hoop house and someone was getting rid of an old one and we, you know, we got it and we built it, even though we don't, we're not the permanent landowner. Uh, we uh, needed a food storage solution and we got a cool bot walk-in fridge with a grant from the Whole Cities Foundation. These things just kind of came along over the years and we needed them and we needed them to be more productive at farming and, and farmers markets. And so we couldn't wait to just answer the questions about land tenure um, that we're still grappling with today. All right, so I think through the land tenure working group, we've explored a few options, but most heavily we've talked about this leaseholder to landowner and we're following um, the great experience that Tobias got by going through the trial by fire of you know, trying to get his, uh, his properties from the city of Newark and being designated developer and going to the planning board and doing all those steps that he's had to do. But I just wanted to note here that there are definitely other, other realms that our group is starting to explore and starting to talk about. And that includes policy change, like how can we change this existing Adopt-A-Lot program and just tweak it a little bit so that we can have more long-term leases or more infrastructure upgrades. Um, more, more flexibility in what we do on the lots. You know, those are all things we do talk about 
Um, and even the idea of a land trust, it's something that's very much in its infancy kind of in, in our group, but obviously a lot of cities across the country and across the world and also rural communities have uh, created ways to conserve their land um, through like legally turning them over to a nonprofit that's a conservation organization, for example. Um, the proposal that I've submitted though is a leaseholder landowner, it's a proposal for purchase. Um, so these are some of the things that, uh, you know, kind of guide planting seeds of hope and my, my founder, uh, Reverend Eric Dobson, who um, is still the founder and president of the, of the organization, you know, is really focused on these kind of core issues. And so I wanted to make sure that whatever we're proposing to develop uh, a site, um, uh, even though we have an urban agriculture background now, we also have all these values in mind and we have this, you know, kind of emphasis on housing uh, and inclusive communities as well. So, um, and I think Dana showed you guys this a little bit. Dana um, uh, was very helpful in drafting kind of like a, a plan for what we, we sort of have now or what's coming in this year in 2021. And so we're already planning this kind of interim renewal of the property that will include a new high tunnel. Um, we have some of the elements in place that you see here, like the composting system and the fridge in the back corner. Um, we have um, a lot of raised berms right now, but we're gonna convert those to raised beds. And you're starting to see kind of taking shape um, like this, this new uh, kind of infrastructure here, including like changing where the driveway into the property is. Um, and this is so this is kind of a plan uh, for the next, um, I would say short to medium term, 2021, 2022. And then jumping ahead, this is a proposed concept for the future, right? So this is more, maybe a little bit more long-term or hopefully if we um, are able to purchase the lot, maybe maybe not too far in the future. Um, but this is kind of the gist of, of, um, of where we wanna go as an organization. And that by that, I mean combining all of our interest in uh, community agriculture and some of the sustainability elements that other presenters talked about tonight and the uh, uh, incredible need for quality affordable housing in the city of Newark and across the state um, my, like I mentioned, my business partner, Eric Dobson, the founder, he is um, a managing uh, director at Fair Share Housing Center. And by, by their estimates, and it kind of depends on how you look at the numbers, but New Jersey is, is short, like hundreds of thousands of affordable housing units. And when that happens, uh, that puts pressure on all levels of the market. So not just people that are below the average income for the state, but that means more people are competing even for the middle income housing and more people are competing for the higher income housing. So the lack of affordable housing in our state is uh, an issue that's raising the prices for all of us. Um, uh, many uh, scholars have called it even the segregation tax whereby people who are living in more affluent communities and more white communities are paying more because we're not providing enough housing that's of quality and affordability for low-income New Jerseyans as well as uh, New Jersey communities of color. So the, the, you know, so these issues really cross up. And this is again, where I think the social work and the, the architect and the designer, um, you know, this, this is, this is uh, you know, this is real, real stuff in our, in our state, in our, in our city. And, and I'll add that in Newark, many of you may or may not know, but we're, we're about 75% renters. And I think what the last presentation uh, also helped to illustrate is that there are other models that can be getting people into home ownership. So, you know, whether or not this proposed uh, farmhouse concept here becomes a home ownership concept or, or it has to kind of start off as a rental because, you know, that's what the financing can bear. Um, we are very interested in the long term in developing more properties that that get people from from renter to homeowner uh, um, and, and, you know, at the affordable uh, income levels because it, it really needs to um, uh, alleviate pressure on, on the market, as well as um, provide wealth building opportunities for people, which homeownership does. And you see here in the concept, by the way, sort of moving the farm infrastructure to the front and having a small garden center, which actually would be a communal space and having the housing pushed to the rear uh, with a sort of slender building, shared driveway here. Um, and so kind of uh, really blending, it's kind of a mixed use property. Here's a, some of the elements, um, you know, none of these are, you know, the most fantastic pictures, but these are pictures from the field of what uh, things that actually do exist. So there'd be a, a tool shed uh, sharing space, there'd be a walk-in cooler, which we already have an example of. Uh, the forced air comp uh, composting system is actually complete, and I'm happy to, you know, talk offline or answer more questions about that in the future. 
Um, like Dana mentioned earlier, it does use solar energy to power a small motor that pushes air through the bottom of the compost bin. This reduces the amount of uh, times that you have to manually turn the food waste and, and garden scraps. Uh, and it accelerates uh, the uh, biology that keeps the temperature really high. So it essentially helps cook the compost in a shorter amount of time. Uh, we do have a rainwater capture with our neighbor's uh, roof there, and we're in the process of getting a pump and a, and a, um, a timer uh, irrigation system this year, high tunnel, and you know, space for training and space for learning, because that's something that Swag Project has always been about. And lastly, Sorry, here's just a quick example. Actually, this is from Pittsburgh. I'm sure you, you Pittsburgh folks are probably familiar with this firm, a module. Uh, my brother actually connected me with them, but this is just a concept design that they use. Uh, these are sort of slender um, single family or, or two family homes with uh, parking underneath. And you can see some green elements integrated into them. Not saying that this is exactly what we would build, but this is the kind of concept of a, a small narrow lot home that we like um, that could be really, we think integrated into the garden center. And we are focused on uh, home ownership uh, for that two and three bedroom, uh, two and three family sort, sort of model, if possible. So, lastly, you know, what is what's our expected impacts for our neighborhood? Well, we've been there as farmers and small scale kind of um, uh, committed uh, uh, community developers for years, uh, educational programming, uh, food access programming, farmers markets. Now we want to make, we want to use, you know, this housing development to kind of make our urban agriculture presence um, permanent. Uh, we want to, we want to own the land, but, um, but make it uh, an accessible community space. So we're not, you know, by any means, large scale developers that are just doing this with just a profit motive. We're, we're trying to pitch this concept as, uh, as uh, creating the assets that the community really needs, uh, generating affordable home ownership units generating food security by always tying urban agriculture to the properties that we develop, um, obviously preserving the ecology, uh, creating spaces for pollinators and, and, and the like. Um, and you know that little garden center that I outlined would be a small commercial asset. So it could have you know continuing our programs of job training of, um, uh, of residents using a subscription uh, community composting program. All those things could take place there. And lastly, I think it's really important that we just want to demonstrate to the city uh, and to other people who um, I will not name names, but some people sort of lack imagination when it comes to development in Newark. And we really want to show, like I think Tobias wants to show, and I, you know, and several others, um, that you don't have to choose like one or the other all the time. Like whether we're just going to keep the natural landscape or or parks or food growing spaces or we're gonna have residential and commercial development. No, we can, we can integrate these things. We can, like many of the presentations showed before, we can have the social and environmental goods mixed in with housing and things that um, you know, are kind of standard for our society and they don't have to replace each other. So that's, that's, um, that's what we're hoping to kind of achieve with this, with this concept. Yeah, okay, so thank you so much, Emilio and Kyle for the presentations regarding housing, um, community development and um, just the social aspect of what we're talking about here in the sustainability conference. Um, to start off the discussion, I would actually like to dir direct two questions to um, Eric and um, Ryan. Yes. Um, and that would be, um, do you think that this kind of housing, the bow grouper model or the things that Emilio had suggested would, or the bow grouper model, would it work in the USA? And what are your thoughts on how to implement the, the bad group uh, in, in Newark specifically? Yeah, it's, um, by the way, thank you everybody who's presented so far. Excellent work. Um, it's exciting to have these conversations. Uh, I, I would say for, um, for the bad group and uh, obviously the, the hurdles that are in front of us are financing. Um, and the other, the other side of the coin is we're afraid to, to work with developers uh, who don't necessarily have the same social barometer, let's call it, uh, the same uh, goals or guiding principles that the rest of us may have. Um, so where I see uh, a benefit to some of the proposals that we've just talked about um, is really the, this idea of mixed use. And <clears throat> the reason I say that is because a traditional bag group in, which is just this, this sort of uh, community building 
um, or community house, let's call it, um, would certainly have a bigger hurdle to overcome in the US, as you've already identified. But when we start to add components like um, job creation, uh, urban agriculture, access to um, uh, fresh produce for food deserts, these things start to align with a lot of uh, initiatives and goals for certain municipalities, particularly Newark in this case. And so I think what, what, what's really, what sticks out to me and what is a strong sort of argument is if we can align, and a lot of these things already do align, which is excellent, um, if we can align sort of the goals uh, and metrics that Newark itself is trying to tackle, housing issues, inequity, food deserts, uh, and we pair that with this new idea of this, this mixed use uh, sort of community, um, I think you can get over a lot of the financial hurdles with backing from uh, various community members, but also with backing from Newark. So I absolutely think it's, it's a viable model. Um, there's you know tricky ways we can either, instead of jumping over the hurdles or going under the hurdles, we go around them. Um, but it's it's they're great proposals, and I think that there's a lot of potential for where this can go and, and the impact it can have in Newark specifically. So uh, I I totally agree with what Ryan's saying. I think the idea of the the mixed use could make these projects more viable. But uh, uh, Kyle, uh, you spoke specifically about the Bow Group co-op housing and then also incubators regarding the Bow Group. From an architectural point of view, it's a wonderful idea. Uh, the The problem is more political than design. So you got to get people organizing, and you've got to advocate for this. And that's a world that I'm not involved in, frankly. What I have been involved in is co-op housing. Yeah, you need a developer, and that brings up the cost because the developer's got to make his profit, right? But at the same time, there are developers out there who have the greater good in mind. Sure, they want to make a living, but at the same time, they, they want to have a legacy. They, and they're committed to innovation. The kind of developers that tend to get into co-op housing tend to be the kind of developers that the kind of people who live in these places would want to work with. Not exclusively, but... Uh, so my experience with co-op housing has been largely positive. The problem with co-op housing is the developers have trouble getting funding often, uh, even though they have the ability to do so, it doesn't make it necessarily uh, happen. And then regarding uh, incubators, yeah, we've, there's many of these in Pittsburgh. My, my experience tells me uh, in reaction to the academic proposals, that most of them in Pittsburgh, because there's so many existing buildings that you can get for super cheap, tend to be adaptive reuse projects rather than bespoke little custom buildings that are collected together to create uh, space. It's a little less sexy maybe, but on the other hand, it's more affordable. And uh, the most important thing is the concept, which is everybody coming together. Definitely. Um, I actually, in with all that information, does anyone know whether you're in Newark or whether you're somewhere else of any informal structure that might sort of emulate what the Bow Grouper model is? Anyone kind of have an idea of that they're a building nearby that might be like that? Um, and if yeah, not, Dana, I can I can speak to that a little bit. I, I don't know the uh, all the details. Maybe uh, Ijoma or uh, Tobias, maybe you. Maybe you remember the name, but uh, I believe there are at I think there are three uh, cooperative housing projects in Newark that have existed since maybe the '60s or '70s, and I think I think one of them is mostly seniors at this point. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong on that. But when um, before Newark Economic Development became Invest Newark, I think a few years ago they had an office within their organization that was um, dedicated to cooperative business, and I remember when they rolled that out, they, um, they had uh, someone come up and speak about the, the housing units. And they're, they're just, you know, the, the buildings themselves in, in Newark were, were not much different than any of the other, um, you know, sort of uh, 10 to 20 story kind of towers uh, with, uh, you, know, uh, you know, standard kind of architecture and all that. 
But what was different was, um, it, I guess, similar to Kyle's presentation, that people had gotten together, put down a little bit more of a down payment, and essentially become like they, they bought into the uh, they co-own the entire building, such that their rents were basically stabilized over the years, and so effectively they were paying uh, less money in rent, you know, than the market rents quite a bit less uh, to this day and um, still covering all the maintenance costs and for the and the building was in great shape. Uh, and then I think also because of that experience, they developed like a community board within the within the building where, um, you know, people could communicate a lot about, you know, the kind of standards and behavior they wanted the building and keeping it clean and all that stuff. So I think, you know, from that standpoint, it was successful. Um, and um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on whatever the name of that that village is, but but uh, maybe someone from Newark here can can say more about it. The the ones I've worked on uh, have been characterized with uh, programs that are different from typical apartment units. Uh, typically, there's uh, shared living rooms and a whole uh, group of people who have bedrooms who share a kitchen, and then these are in sort of pod organizations. And you'll have a couple of these on each floor. So it's groups of people sort of living together. And then in addition to these shared pod amenities, there's also uh, shared building amenities, large public spaces that sort of substitute for the space that you would have in a typical home. And you'd be encouraged to leave your own space and take part in this kind of communal living uh, arrangement. And to, to that point, uh, you know, there's an economy to that, right? There's an economy to that scale of building where you're not, you know, building the same unit over and over and there's dead space throughout the day because you're at work. People are sharing spaces. Uh, and so the, the cost of construction is cheaper uh, for that model, co-housing model. So there, there's also an economy to that, um, which is important to point out. Yeah, thank you everybody for um, these thoughts. I, I did share a link in the chat to the studio booklet and there's a lot of um, precedent studies on co-housing, different models. Um, so if anyone wants to spend any more time with that, um, please follow that. This year's conference was made possible with the support of Whole Cities Foundation, the North Community Food System, and the Rutgers Landscape Architecture Department. To learn more, visit us at www.sasglocal.com or follow us on our social media outlets.